Hey, are you guys awake this morning? You awake? Who's got crusties in their eyes still? Who slept in past their alarm? You snoozed this morning. Where's the snoozers at? Who got up, jumped out of bed, you were ready to go this morning? I'm, I'm more on the snooze type. That's me. I, I'll snooze until like it gets way too past it, and then I, I'm too far gone at that point. But it's great to see all of you here this morning. I'm Pastor Zach. Uh, I'm the middle school pastor here at New Hope, um, and I'm preaching today, so I'm sorry. Don't leave. Uh, but I, I've got a word that I want to share that I feel like God's put on my heart. But before I get to that, uh, I want to share with you kind of my heart for ministry and youth and, and with Pastor Luke. And Pastor Luke and I, we love uh, working with the students, the middle schoolers, the high schoolers. Uh, we love pouring into them and uh, um, preaching to them and, and doing life with them. But what I'm afraid is that uh, we're creating, we're kind of creating a culture that has been, um, not us personally, but just kind of our, our generation and our world is kind of creating this culture where uh, we're expecting uh, the church to do all the ministry and then as families, you would then supplement the ministry that's being done here. So, so we're the ones doing, leading all that way and then you add to it, but I think that's reversed. I think really what it should be is as families, as parents, as grandparents, aunt and uncles, you should be doing, uh, you should be pouring into your students, you should be teaching them and walking through that and then as, as the youth pastors, as the children's pastors, as, as the people preaching on Sunday mornings, as they preach, that is just adding to what you've already taught them. Uh, in Proverbs, it, it talks about training up your kids in the way they should go, right? And, and I'm afraid that uh, we're creating this culture that cares too much about kids, too much about our, our teens, our young adults getting into college, getting into sports teams, than we do about them getting into heaven. And I think that needs to change. When we look at the parable of the sower, uh, uh, the seed is thrown out, and there's all different types of, of soil, right? There's a little bit of soil. There's some with no, no soil. There's some with a lot of soil. And, and I'm afraid that uh, many times the seed is thrown out there on a Sunday morning, on a Wednesday night. And for, for students, for, for yourself, I think we need to check our hearts. Uh, what kind of soil is our heart? Do we have a lot of soil? Is there, have you been um, pouring into your student, your, your, your child, your grandchild, where that soil is deep and that seed's going to land and it's going to grow up into something strong? Or is that going to sprout up for a couple days and then, and then weather away and die because there's not enough soil? Um, so, so that's my heart. I know that's kind of like putting it all out there, but I wanted to share with you my heart and something that God's been kind of speaking to me on that, that, that we need to create our hearts, uh, whether it's good soil, where we need to be pouring into ourselves, into our own lives, into, into our children, our grandchildren, so, so that when the seed is put out there, that they're able to uh, grow up nice and strong and, and, and train them so that they'll be following Jesus when they get old. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning, uh, I've got some fun dates for you, all right? The, the title of the message today, if you're taking notes, because note takers are because note takers are world changers. world changers. All right, I'm gonna say because note takers are, and then you'll say world changers. If you're taking notes, say because note takers are world. world changers. Title is best day ever. Best day ever. Turn to your neighbor and say, today could be your best day ever. Now turn to the neighbor you just ignored and say, neighbor, you might be my second choice, <laughs> but today, could be the best day ever. So looking at best day ever, I found some dates, some big dates, and, and I'm gonna ask you some questions, and you try to guess what happened on that date. So Vanna, can you come on up here quick for me? Vanna's got a gift, a, a box full of goodies for us, but this first, one, this first one will be pretty easy for us, all right? So I'm gonna say a date, and you shout out what happened on that date. July 4th, 1776. Independence Day, right? America, turn your neighbor and say America. America, right? America, Independence Day, that one's easy, all right? So now I'm going to throw some dates out there. It might be a company that started. It might be a store that opened. It might be anything like that. So our first one is this, March 31st, 1971. What opened on that day? Who said Starbucks? Perk, you were here first service. Shut your face. <laughs> what do you do? Starbucks, right? Starbucks opened on March 31st, 1971. And you look like you could use some Starbucks drink. There you go. Now, I, now you can't be falling asleep on me now. All right. Second one, March 6, 1912. March 6, 1912. This little, this little thing came into the stores, a little cookie, uh, a little delicious. Who said it? Who said Oreos? Taylor Weaver wins some Oreos coming in hot. Yeah, Oreos 
Right, delicious. Who loves Oreos? Who loves Oreos? Oreos is your jam. Right, I was reading about Oreos. When they first started selling them, 25 cents for a pound. They were selling them by the pound for Oreos. 25 cents a pound. If that was happening right now, I would probably go broke because I would just go there and just be dishing out the quarters. All right, last one. All right. This might go good with your breakfast if you haven't eaten yet or anything like that. October 25th, 2012. Come on, what happened? What, what opened? What opened? Come on, Duncan. Where? Who was it, Vanna? Right there. Dunkin' Donuts. Dunkin' Donuts came back to Des Moines on that day. Came back to Des Moines. They were gone while, but they came back. Share those with your friends, all right? <laughs> but dates, right? There's all sorts of dates that happen, all sorts of things that we look back on of being awesome things, of being delicious things, of being great days like Independence Day, 4th of July, right? A great holiday to celebrate. Um, so the next one is this, October 6th, 1993. That was my birthday, right? That's my birthday, come on. I know some of you guys already got it marked on your calendar. You're counting down the days, trying to think of what to buy me. It's, I know, we're excited. Uh, May 23rd, 2015. That's the day I got married, right? One of the best days ever, right? This is time for you husbands to turn to your wife and be like, honey, the best day ever was fill in the blank your, your wedding day. Don't mess it up, right? And get some extra brownie points there. Right, the day, the day you're born, the day you get married. Uh, the last one is this, July 20, 2010. This is, this is the day that, that I really started to live my life for Jesus, right? I grew up going to church uh, my whole life, knowing what the Bible says, being a Christian, uh, all that stuff. But July 20th, 2010, the summer going from my sophomore year to my junior year, a Tuesday night at high school camp, I made the decision that th I'm gonna start taking this for real. No longer is it gonna be my parents' faith. No longer is it gonna be their decision, but it's my decision from this point on. This is the time where I'm gonna start living for Jesus with all my heart. And me and some friends, we started a group text where, where we were keeping each other accountable on, on reading your Bible, where we would send each other our, our verses every day that we would read, and if someone wasn't reading, we'd be like getting on them because they weren't reading their Bible. And that was the day that things began to change for me. The old me was gone, the new had begun. If you're taking notes today, uh, uh, you can write this verse out or you can turn to it in your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Otherwise, there's a massive Bible up here on the stage that you can look at that hopefully you'll be able to read that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. What's the first word in that verse? Therefore, right? If we see therefore, what do we look at? What it is therefore. We, if there's therefore, we say, well, what is it therefore? So we say, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. So what is it therefore? Let's jump back to verses 14 through 15. It says, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. We recognize that Jesus, he came to earth and he died on a cross for us. Not something that we deserve to have happen. Not something that he did because he owed us one, right? He doesn't owe us anything. But he came and he died on the cross for us. One man dying, where, where now we no longer live for ourselves. We no longer live for the worldly things. We no longer live for things that this world has to offer. But now we live for Jesus. We live for, for him uh, and no longer ourselves. So we look at what is a new creation? What is a new creation? Uh, I want to say a new creation is not something that we inherit. We don't inherit a new creation. Maybe, maybe your parents, they grew up going to church and maybe, maybe they're Christians their whole life and maybe now they're in heaven or whatever. And just because your parents uh, are Christians, just because your parents were made a new creation at one point, does not mean that now you've inherited that new creation, no. And it's, not, and it's also something that we don't create for ourselves. We can't come in and we can't create ourselves new. We can't do that on our own. But rather, Jesus comes in and he makes us new. It's like, picture it this way, as a total renovation, right? It's not like our life and then God's coming up and he's adding himself to what we already have going on. Rather, it's a renovation where he comes in and he wipes it clean, right? He, he takes down the, the walls, he, he pours out, he uh, uh, rips up the old carpet, right? And he puts down all new stuff, all new walls, all new countertops, new cabinets, right? It's fully new. It's not just painted over. It's all brand new, totally new, totally fresh. So new creation. So what is, what is our old things? 
The old things are our old ways of doing things, uh, our, our old sin, our sin nature, our, our love of sin, our love of self, our self-righteousness, all these things that are the way that we used to do life. The, the pains that we used to have, the hurt that we used to have, now, now created new. Those things, were, those things when Jesus died on a cross were now nailed to the cross with him and he took those away. So what happened on July 20th was the old me was gone, right? The, my old ways of doing things is now the old way and now I'm stepping into a new way. Maybe today you come in with baggage, you come in with hurt, with sin, with, with a love of self, a love of sin, and, and that's, the, that's the old way. And, and today God wants to take those old ways and he wants to make you new again. Today you might be sitting there saying, well that's awesome, Pastor Zach, that that happened to you and you know, that actually happened to me uh, last month or, or last year or 10 years ago or 20 years ago where, where I went from being an old creation to now a new creation and it was awesome in that moment. Like it was really cool that that happened and you know, I've been working to live for Jesus ever since. You know, it's not, it's not always the greatest but I'm, I'm working for it. Or maybe today you sit there and you're like, man, I've never heard of this in Christ, being made in Christ, not living for myself but, but living for, for him because he died for me and I'm not real sure what to think about that, like about being in Christ. I, I'm into donuts, I'm into coffee, I'm into that guy, I'm into that girl, I'm into my job where I can make money, but to be into Christ, I'm, I'm not real sure what I think about that. Maybe that's where you sit today. Well, today's gonna be a little different. You see, I don't have the pulpit up here, uh, not because I think that I'm cooler than everyone, which I am cooler than Pastor Weaver, but um, not just because I think I'm cooler than everyone and I need to do something different, but I'll be doing an illustration today um, where people will be sitting in these seats and I'm gonna be telling stories, uh, not specific to anyone in here, not specific to the people that will be sitting up here. The names have nothing to do with anyone specific, but my prayer today is that you would relate to one of these stories, that maybe a full story would relate perfectly with your life, maybe parts of a story, and you see where these stories go from an old creation to now a new creation, where the old is gone and the new is here. So our first story that we see this morning is the story of Julia. And Julia's story is a story of being in pain. See, Julia, she lived with just her mom all growing up. Her, her dad, uh, she never knew her dad. Her dad left her mom when he found out that she was pregnant with her. So she grew up uh, with just a single mom. Growing up, her mom would make sure to get her in church. Uh, they were Catholic, and they, they, would, they would try to go pretty regularly. And Julia, she never really, she never really liked it. She, she just came into there because her mom made her, and she saw it as a place of uh, judgy people. So getting older, uh, Julia's mom begins to work more, uh, work, work a lot because she's a single parent and, and now Julia has all this free time. And, and with all this free time and without a father in her life to ever tell her how, how beautiful she is, how much he loves her, uh, what she can be when she grows up and how awesome she is and all this stuff, she begins to give herself away to guys. She begins to do things with guys, she begins to tell things to guys. She really just starts to go with whatever guy will give her attention. Well, this starts to just kind of become who she is, and, and she, she goes to school, and she kind of gets these names that, that come with doing all these things. And, and, but one day at school, a friend comes up to her, and they invite her to church. She thinks, all right, I'll, I'll go there. I know some people there. And she comes to youth group one night, and one much like ours here. And she comes, and there she, she hears about Jesus, and she gives her life to Jesus. And the old is gone, and the, the new has begun. And she starts living for Jesus. She starts, she starts coming to church on Wednesday nights, on, on Sunday morning. She starts to begin to change things. Uh, new friend groups. She's hanging out with all these friends all the time, these new friends, and getting plugged in that way. Well, since she's not at home anymore, since she doesn't really see things that are going on, in the meantime, her mom gets this new boyfriend. And they're dating for a little while, and then, and then they end up getting married. Julie doesn't really know who this uh, new stepfather is, but she sees that her mom's happy. And she says, well, if she's happy, you know, I'm happy. Time goes on a little bit, and Julia and her mom start to notice some different things from their stepfather. Uh, Julia and her mom, they, they start getting abused uh, verbally. He begins telling them things, telling lies to them, uh, dictating how, how they live their life, who they talk to, where they go, all these different things. Um, and then it starts to get physical, and he starts hitting Julia, starts hitting her mom, and it becomes a physical abuse. And one night, Julia at home ends up getting raped by her stepfather. Now Julia, she feels embarrassed, she, she feels disgusted. She doesn't want anyone to know what happened, so she, starts, she stops going to church because she's embarrassed of what people are gonna think of her. And after a little bit of time, she ends up running away because things at home don't get any better. Running away, she goes back to the old things. Although she had been made new, she let the old back in. 
And she, she starts giving herself away to guys so that she can pay for food or whatever else. And she starts going to parties and, and drinking and, and doing drugs. And, and she ends up meeting uh, this guy and, and she starts dating this guy and he's a drug dealer. Uh, so she starts to sell with him and they, they, you know, that's how their way of making money. And she loves him. Uh, she's never really had a real boyfriend. It's just kind of been uh, one night type of things for her all leading up to that. So every time that he's abusive to her, she, she forgives him. Every time he says lies to her, she, she forgives him because she loves him. Well, they end up having, having a kid together and, and they start to go through that. And, what, and during this time, Julia, she started to make this new friend who had gone through a, a life much similar to hers, through a lot of the same pains, the same hurts, the same story as hers. And, and her and this friend started to talk a lot and they got really close. Well, one night that she gets a call from this friend and on the other line, her friend's telling her that she can't do it anymore. That, that the pain's too bad, the depression's too bad, and she doesn't want to live here anymore. And Julia's frantic, and, and she rushes over to her friend's house only to get there in time to see that her friend commits suicide. So now this pain that Julia had before is now multiplied by a hundred after seeing what she just saw. And now this leads to drinking more and, and doing more drugs, and, and she ends up getting her, her child taken away, and now her pain is multiplied, and she is so deep in pain and so deep in depression that she doesn't even know, she doesn't even know which way is which. And, and she is so deep in drugs and alcohol. And maybe today you're sitting here, and this is a, a story much similar to yours. Maybe some of the same things, maybe going through abuse or, or neglect or, or be, feeling abandoned, alone, or, or going through different uh, struggles of, of substance abuse. And you find yourself sitting in the same seat, or maybe you, you see the seat and you say, wow, I thought I had some pain in my life, but like that, that is, that's way more, and you know, what's my pain compared to that? But hear me this morning, that your pain is real. And I believe that God brought you here for a reason, because he wants to heal your pain. And I'm so glad that, that you followed someone's invite. I'm so glad that your alarm went off this morning, that you got out of bed, and that you made it a point to be here. Because I believe that God has you here on purpose for a purpose, that God's got a purpose for your life, and he wants to heal your pain. He wants to heal your hurts. He wants to heal your, your struggles. The next story we have is a story about a man named Blake. Blake's story is a story of being in guilt. Growing up, Blake was like, he was like any other kid, nothing too different. Uh, grew up with a, a good family. They, they went to church, uh, weren't really religious, uh, just went to church, saw that as being a good thing to do. Um, so they would go to church and kind of just check it off their to-do list for the week. And, and Blake growing up, he, he gets into high school and he starts playing on the football team, on the basketball team. One day in the locker room, uh, he's sitting there after practice and a friend shows him a magazine and, and he sees pornography for the first time in the locker room. At first, he's a little embarrassed about it. First, he, he doesn't really know what to think, uh, you know, a little uh, grossed out by, by what he sees, but he quickly becomes desensitized to it. And now what he thinks is controllable, an addiction begins in his life. Growing through high school, he didn't really tell anyone about it. He, he knew it wasn't right because he had gone to church, but, but he didn't really, you know, he didn't really care that much. And, uh, but he didn't want anyone to know, just his friends that would talk about it and joke about it. Well, Blake ends up going to college. And there at college, he, he meets this girl named Sarah. The, the most beautiful girl he had ever seen, the love of his life, the girl of his dreams, and they begin dating. Well, as they, as, as they continue dating, he continues struggling with this addiction, and, and as they continue dating, words like uh, forever, words like marriage, words like family begin coming up in topics of discussion. And, and one thing leads to the next, and they end up getting engaged. Well, Blake, seeing that they're engaged, and he loves Sarah so much, she's, a, she's the best thing that ever happened to him. He, he wants to honor her. So he says, when we get married, I'm done looking at all that stuff. I'm not going to look at it anymore because I want to honor her because I love her so much. And, and time goes by, and they get married. And at first, Blake's doing really well with it. But a couple months go by, and same things come back in. Addictions come back to him, and, and it's something that he begins to struggle with again. Not, not telling Sarah, she doesn't really know anything about it, um, but, but he just kind of continues living with that, with that as a secret in his life. Well, at work, things start going well for him. Uh, his business that he works for is doing really well, and so well that they actually uh, can hire a few new people. So they hire some new people, and in that new group of hirees, uh, there's this new younger woman there that, that all, the, all the guys look at, and they're like, wow. She's, she is gorgeous. Man, if I wasn't married, I, I, would, I would be with her. And then they all would talk about it. Well, one day after work, they all go out uh, to the bar for drinks afterwards. Blake begins to talk to this girl, and, and before long, they realize that they're the only two left at the bar. One thing leads to the next, which leads to the next, and Blake ends up doing something that he never thought he would ever do, and he cheats on, he cheats on his wife. He, he's not loyal to his wife. His wife, Sarah, she, she finds out, and she's devastated. They, they separate for a while, and now Blake is sitting in the seat of shame. 
in a seat of guilt, in a seat of addiction, because, because he didn't deal with things at a younger age, they now led up to, led up to him being in the same seat of, of shame and, and guilt. Maybe today you find yourself sitting in this seat, maybe from similar events, maybe from things unrelated to that, but you find yourself sitting in a seat of addiction where, where you're strong with stuff and, and maybe no one knows about it, maybe everyone knows about it, but you're strong with addiction and maybe, you're, maybe you've done some things that led to another and you're sitting in a seat of shame and guilt, but hear me this morning, that God wants to heal your shame. He wants to heal your guilt. I believe that you're here for a reason, that you're here on purpose for a purpose, that God has a purpose for your life and today he wants to heal your guilt. He wants to take you from the old to the new. So maybe those first two stories don't really, you know, relate to, relate to yours, but maybe the third story will relate, and it's a story of a girl named Amber. And Amber sits in a seat of being in doubt. Amber grew up in an atheist family. In middle school, uh, Amber struggled with getting bullied, with getting picked on, um, you know, nothing's for no really reason, just middle schoolers being mean to each other, and she, she really struggled with that, which kind of led to starting to get some depression, and, and when she gets to high school, she says, you know what, I'm done being the one that everyone makes fun of, I'm done with that, I'm going to make a name for myself. So when she gets to high school, she begins going to parties, uh, she begins to drink, she begins to uh, sleep with guys, give herself away to guys, and actually this ends up leading to her being popular, this ends up leading to her being on the in crowd. And, and uh, she, she begins to drink more, and, and she realizes that the more friends that she gets, the more she drinks. And the more guys that she's with, the emptier she feels. And the emptier she feels, the more depressed she gets. The more depressed she gets, the more she drinks. And it just begins this vicious cycle in her life uh, of, of pain, of, of substance abuse. And, and this, this depression actually ends up to not her just thinking about suicide, but to her actually attempting suicide. And one night uh, in her room at home, Amber, Amber tries to overdose on some drugs and only to have her brother find her and rescue her what you think would be a good thing, what you think would be a time where things can turn around, but, but it actually led to her just thinking, I'm a failure at everything. I can't even succeed at ending my own life. Well, growing up in an atheist family, she never had really anyone talking about God, and, and she, she realizes that she has tried everything to take away the pain. She's tried everything, but, but maybe there's a God. Maybe there's a God out there, and, and maybe she'll give that a chance. So at home in her room by herself, never praying to God before, she, she says something like this, uh, hello, God, uh, are, are, are you there, God? If, if there even is a God, dear God, uh, I pray that um, you would just show yourself to me. I'm sick and tired of feeling empty. I'm sick and tired of feeling alone, of, of feeling down, of feeling depressed. I'm sick and tired of not having any hope. And I want to know that you are real. And maybe today you sit in that same seat or you've gone through some stuff and you have doubts. You, you, you're questioning God and you're saying, God, I wanna know that you're real. God, I, I need you to prove yourself. Well, her prayer continues to go on and say something like this. So she says, God, I wanna know you're real. So I want you to prove yourself. I want you to prove yourself to me that you're real. And if you don't, then I'm gonna kill myself for real this time. And maybe that's where you find yourself. Where you're saying, you know what, God, if you don't show yourself, I'm, I'm done doing this whole thing. God, I, I've never really seen you move. So like, are you even there? And you sit there and you question God and you doubt God. And you can't be made new because you are in doubt. But hear me that this is a place to bring your doubt. This is a place to bring your questions. This is a place to, to bring your confusion. And I believe that you too are here for a reason. That you're here on purpose for a purpose. That God wants to heal your, he wants to heal your doubt today. He wants to heal your pain today. And he wants to take you from an old life to being made new today. The, the last seed that we have here I think uh, applies to many of us in the room. This last seat that we have, uh, it represents all of us who are in complacency. And, and this is a story of a young man named Ben. We see that we can't be in Christ because we are too deep of being in complacency, being complacent in our faith. If we were to tell all the stories of the Bens in here this morning, it might look something like this. Ben grew up uh, going to church. His family was in church all the time. He loved going to church. It felt like every time the doors were open, he was there with his family. They were there uh, at, at Sunday morning, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights, every event that was going on, they were there. And, and he loved going to church. 
he, he loved it. And in, in youth, he, he goes to a church camp one summer, and there he, he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's on fire for God, and he goes back to his school. He's telling everyone about Jesus, and, and, and he just kind of uh, just is excited about what's going on in his life because of Jesus, and, and that's just kind of who he is. Well, he ends up graduating high school and moving on to, to college, and, and there at college, he, he's going to a state school, but he quickly finds a church, gets himself plugged in, is helping out greeting, usher, uh, helping out with the youth, the children, any way he can, he's there. Uh, although he's busy, although he's got all this schoolwork to do, he's, he's making time to read his Bible, he's making time to, to pray and do his devotions and, and all this stuff, and he's, he's just on fire for God. Well, at school, he, he meets this girl, and she too is on fire for God. She too loves Jesus with all her heart, and, and they get, they, after they graduate, they get married, and they move to a new city so that they can uh, start these new jobs that they have. Once they get to this new city, they, they quickly find a church. They, they find a new church that they like, and, and they get themselves plugged in, you know, helping at the doors, helping with the youth, all, the, all that sort of stuff. And uh, as, as life begins happening, uh, you know, kids come into the picture, and uh, uh, life begins to happen, and at, ben, or at, yeah, at Ben's work, um, you know, things aren't going so well, and, you know, they, he finds out that they're downsizing, and, and he ends up getting let go from his job. Going through this time, he, he starts looking for new jobs. He starts looking for what's out there, and, and he's not really finding anything. Nothing's really uh, catching. There's no bites really going on. And, and he, during this time, he begins to question God. He doesn't doubt that God's real. He just begins to question, God, why are you letting this happen to me? God, you know, you've proved yourself so, so many times to me. Why, why is this not happening? God, do you, do you care about me anymore? I, I've done this for the church. I've done, I've done this. You know, I, I've been faithful, and now you aren't proving yourself faithful back to me. And he begins to, to go through this tough time of questioning God. And, and, he, and his relationship with, with Christ really struggles during this time. His family continues uh, to, to go to church, but you know, life starts to get busier and kids get older and sports schedules and, and vacations and, and all this stuff starts to happen. And going to church uh, is no longer a thing where they're excited, where they're excited to get plugged in, where they're excited to, to hear what God's saying, excited to worship, but now it's, it's become something of just, you know, we, this is something we do. We gotta check this off the to-do list. And to the, to the church on the outside, everything looks great. They, they look like they're doing awesome. They, they look like everything is, they've got it all together. But inside, inside they're spiritually dead. And maybe this is, this is a place where you find yourself this morning. Or at one point, you were so excited about your faith. At one point, you were so excited to know more about God. You were so excited to come in and worship God, to raise your hands, to, to open up your Bible and see, see what it's saying and how you can apply it to your life. But now you've kind of fallen off, and it's, it's just kind of become routine for you, a checklist thing for you to do. And, and maybe you come in here instead of worshiping uh, the God that the song is about, now your worship is dictated on whether it's a song you like or not. Your worship is dictated on whether it's too loud, whether it's too quiet, whether the lights are too bright, whether it's too dim in here, whether it's too hot, whether it's too cold. You dictate what you're gonna get out of a message based on which pastor comes up to preach and you base whether the Holy Spirit is here or not on how you're feeling in that moment. And no longer is it something you're excited about, but something that you just come in to do, to check off your checklist, to, to judge what's going on, to, to say if it was a good day in service or not because you like the songs, because you like the message, not based on what God is doing in your life, not based on what God is doing in other people's lives. And today you realize that that passion's gone. You realize that, that, that you're not excited about it anymore, and today you find yourself sitting in the same seat of being complacent. But hear me, that God has you here for a reason that you're here on purpose for a purpose. It wasn't by accident that you woke up this morning. Maybe this morning you woke up and you're like, oh man, I got a busy week at work this next week. Maybe, maybe I should just sleep in, you know, maybe I could, I could live stream or man, the kids were up all night last night and if I wake them up now, they're, they're not gonna nap this afternoon or, or oh man, like I, I've got a bunch of stuff to do today. So maybe, maybe I could just, you know, maybe I won't go this week. But I believe that you're here for a reason. I believe that God's got you here for a reason and God wants to begin to do something new in your life. He wants to bring that first love back into your life. He wants to fill you with his presence. He wants to fill you with his joy and his love in your life today. Doesn't have to stay this way any longer. We look at all these stories and we see one side of it. We see in complacency, we see in doubt and guilt and pain. But, but these stories, they don't just have one side. It doesn't have to be that way any longer. Remember 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. The old is gone. You might be like, wow, you know, Pastor Zach, these, like, these are good stories. They're, they're sad, I feel bad for, for these people. They've obviously gone through some through some rough stuff and all, but, but what's the good in that? Hear me, the old is gone. The old is gone, it's wiped away. It's not just God adding himself to it. it the old is gone, it's totally wiped away and a new creation has begun. 
A new creation is here. And it's not because of something that we do, but it's like I said, because Jesus came down to earth perfect, without sin, and he died on a cross taking our sin, taking our pain, taking our guilt with him, and that being nailed to the cross with him, and now we can begin a new life. See, for Julia, although she sits in a seat of being in pain, you no longer find Julia in pain, but now you find Julia in Christ. See, for Julia, the best day ever happened about one year after that horrible night where she saw her friend commit suicide, where she experienced all this bad stuff, where her life started to crumble down, where she lost her child. And and as she's going through life, as she's struggling through depression and and addiction and substance abuse, she's walking around town one night and she sees a church and it's it's open. And so she goes in and she sits in on the church service that night. And there the pastor has an altar call, just like one that's about to happen here in just a little bit. And and she realizes, man, I, I can't handle this pain anymore. I can't handle this depression anymore. And she goes and she prays, Jesus, give me peace. And in that moment, she felt a peace overwhelm her. She, she felt something new begin in her life where the old was gone and the new was here. She, she felt an undeniable love, an undeniable presence of God. And she was reminded of all those times growing up uh, where she was in church for that short time, where she felt loved, where she, where she felt that God was faithful to her. She was reminded of that. And now you no longer find Julia in pain, but now you find her in Christ. Hear this today. If God can heal Julia of that pain, then he can heal you of your pain. He can heal you of your depression, uh, of your substance. He can heal that. And you no longer have to struggle with that, but now you can be found in Christ. You can be made new again. See, the same is true for Blake. There was a lot of time spent for Blake after that, after that mess up that he had of just sitting in shame and sitting in guilt. But now you no longer find Blake in guilt, but now you find Blake in Christ. You see, for Blake, at first he was angry. He was mad at God, he was mad at himself, he was mad, just had everything kind of going around because of this mistake he made. And he decided, you know what? You know, I, I've always kind of gone to church, I'll go to church this week or whatever. And he's sitting in the back and he felt God just kind of speaking to him. And, and when the pastor did an altar call, much like one that's gonna happen here this morning, he got up out of his seat and he came forward. He came forward to tell God about why he was mad at him, to tell God about why he was upset about everything that was going forward. He comes forward and he begins to, to lay it all out there on the altar. And in that moment, the guilt, the shame was all gone and he felt Christ's love flow over him. He, he felt God to just give him peace, give him his undeniable presence and forgive him of, of the things that he had done. And he began to move past that. Blake, Blake uh, he, he realized that he couldn't fix it on his own. He realized that the, the struggles he had, the addictions he had from the time that he was in high school, leading up to, to the guilt that he had at this time in, in his adult age, that he couldn't fix it by just sitting in his seat because he had, he had to get up and he had to move and he, he had to give it to God. He said, man, I, I've tried to fix, fix this addiction of pornography pretty much my whole life, but now, like, I gotta give it to God and God fixes that, God, God heals that, God, God begins to do something new in that. He, he goes to his wife, Sarah, and they begin talking, and they begin going to counseling, and, and things aren't all, all fine and dandy right away, but they begin to work through their problems. They begin to work through their, their pain and, and the guilt and the shame and, and the anger that came with all that, and now you find them together in Christ. Now you find them together using their testimony to reach other people. Now you find them more in love with each other and more in love with Christ than, than they ever were before, and now they're found in Christ. Then, then there's the story of Amber. She was a story of being in doubt. Remember, she said, God, if you don't show yourself, if you don't prove yourself to me, I'm gonna end my life for real this time. Well, Amber, she no longer finds herself in doubt, but now she finds herself in Christ. And her best day ever happened the next morning after she, she prayed that prayer. She, she walks up to school, and in front of the school, there's someone handing some stuff out. As people are walking in, she goes up and she takes one of them. She opens it up and it's a Bible. She begins reading the Bible and she realizes it's the most real thing that she's ever read. That it's the most, that she's feeling something that she's never felt before just by reading this. And she says, man, I want this in my life. I, I can't go on without this. So she, so she shows up to a church. Remember, she's, she's atheist. She, she's, her family's never been to church. They don't talk about God or anything like that. They don't believe in God. And she shows up to church without anybody knowing about it. She sits there. She sits in the back and she watches. She comes the next weekend, she watches. The next weekend, she watches. And she realizes in that moment, man, I can't, I can't go on without this being part of my life. I can't go on without, without God's love uh, being part of my life, without accepting Jesus in my life, without being found in Christ. And she, she built up the courage in that service, alone by herself, not believing in God, doubting God for much of her life. And she got up and she came to the altar and she, she laid it all out there. And in that moment, she, she realized that God's love had been with her for so long, that, that God had protected her, that God, that God loved her so much. Now you no longer find her in doubt, but now you find her in Christ. Lastly, we have the story of Ben and worship team. You can come on up. I think today that there are many Ben sitting in this place. 
I think today there's many of us who, who sit in a, in a stage of complacency. From the outside, you see, you see this and, and you see this story and it doesn't seem that bad. There's not, there wasn't anything that he really did to, to mess up any bad things. And you look at these and you say, man, those, those are rough. Man, those people have gone through some tough things. They, they've really struggled in life. And, but, but like to be in complacency, that's not too bad. But really in the end, it's all the same. Dead in Christ, spiritually dead. And, and you, you don't find yourself in Christ because, because you're complacent and you're not excited about that. See, see for, for Ben, the best day ever happened uh, on a day much similar to this. Ben and his family, they showed up to church one morning just to kind of check it off the to-do list, you know, had plans for the afternoon, didn't really want to come that morning, but, but knew that they probably should, so they came the, to check it off the to-do list. And as the message was going on, Ben was sitting there and, and he felt like, like the pastor was preaching right to them. Like he, like he was telling him everything that was going on in his life. Like he, he knew his story and he was talking right to him. And he f- had that feeling the whole service. And when the altar call happened, one much similar than that, that's going to happen to this morning. He got up from his seat, making a decision for his family. Not a, just a decision for himself, but deciding for his family, saying, me and my family, this is something that we're going to do. This is something we're going to make a priority. I don't want to be in this stage anymore. I want to be made new in Christ. I, I don't want yesterday's bread. I want today's bread. I want to fill myself up every single day with this. And now Ben and his family, they, they're no longer found in complacency, but now they are found in Christ. And now they, now they are back on fire for God. Now they're back plugged in. They're back being excited to come to church, being excited to learn more about what God has for their life. Hear me, God can do this for you. Maybe you find yourself in pain. Maybe you find yourself in in shame, in in doubt, in complacency. But hear me, God can take that away. He can make you new in Christ. The old is gone. The new is here. But hear this. Many times our faith is emotion-activated faith. If I was to go out there to the lobby and go to the bathroom and I was to walk up to the sink and look at the sink, me just looking at the sink isn't going to get the water flowing isn't gonna get something happening, isn't gonna wash my hands. But when I walk up to the sink and I move and I put my hands under it and I begin to move them back and forth, the water is gonna begin flowing out. The same is true for our faith. Many times we sit there saying, oh, come on, God, do something in my life. God, come on, I want you to do this. But we sit there in the same seat that we've always sat. We sit there doing the same things that we've always done, the same struggles that we've always had. And we say, God, come on, I I want you to do this for me. God, come on, prove yourself to me. But we need to get ourselves up. We need to begin to change things. We need to ask God, God, what is it in my life that needs to change? What is it in my life that, that you wanna see something different happen? And it's emotion activated faith. But hear me, t- today I don't, no longer do I wanna be found old. Yesterday was an old, old day. Today's a new day, so today I wanna be a new creation. Yesterday I had struggles. Yesterday I, I did things. If we would all look back at yesterday, there's some things that if we could change, we probably would. And yesterday's an old day, but today's a new day, which means we can be a new creation. I think for too long we've been eating yesterday's bread. We've been having day old bread. We've been having last week's bread. We've been having last month's bread, right? Where, where we're filling ourselves up with the word on Sunday. We fill ourselves up and we feel good on Sunday morning. And then we leave and, and Monday, you know, we're, we're just going off of what we heard Sunday and Tuesday, you know, off of what we heard Sunday and Wednesday. By then it's just, it's just kind of old. Think about it this way. If you go to Jimmy John's, you can buy day old bread. If I was to go to Jimmy John's, I'd say, hey, put the, put the day old bread on my sandwich. Uh, and I was to go eat that sandwich, it's gonna be a little hard. But if I decide to say, hey, you know, do you have anything from like two days ago? Can I, can I eat some bread from two days ago? I eat that, that's gonna be real hard. That's not gonna be good. The same is true for our walk with God. We wanna fill ourselves up with something new today. God might've revealed something to you yesterday, but that's not for today, that was for yesterday. Today is something new. Today God wants a new creation from you. Today God wants to do something new in your life. If you would stand all across this room this morning, August 27th, 2017 could be the best day ever for you. It could be the day where, where you look back on it and say, man, that's the day when things started to change. Like I, I was all right going up to that point, but when that day happened, things changed. And you say, man, I was terrible up to that day. Man, things were rough. My life was hurting. I, I was in addiction. I was in pain. I was in hurt. I was in shame. And, and that day, things began to change. Maybe today you sit there and you say, man, from that, that day was the day that I went from deciding that I'm going to just go to church and go through the motions to decide, man, I'm going to make this in every single decision, every single day decision. I'm going to choose Christ every single day. I want to choose a new thing every single day. Hear me, God can heal your doubt. God can heal your pain. He can heal your depression. He can heal your suicidal thoughts. He he can heal your addiction. He can heal the chains that are holding you back of of depression, of of bondage and and, and your abuse and your neglect. He can heal that and you can be made new in Christ today. 
not something that you can do on your own, but because Jesus came down to earth and he died on a cross, he made that bridge for us. So here's how this is going to go down this morning. I'm going to pray. And when I say amen this morning, if, if you're ready to respond, saying, I want to go from, from in pain. I want to go from in doubt. I want to go from in addiction. I want to go from in whatever it is that you've been in to in Christ. Then as, as an outward expression for an inward uh, decision, you're, you can come down to the altar saying, I'm going to make sure people know. I, I'm going to be motion activated where I come down and I say, this is me. This is the new me. I, I'm no longer being in a stage of complacency. No longer don't want to be in the stage of addiction. But today I want to be made new. Tomorrow I want to be made new and we're gonna decide to to choose Jesus every single day. Dear Jesus, God, we we thank you, God, for this morning. We thank you for every person that is here, God, that you have them here for a reason, that they're here on purpose, for a purpose, God, that that you have something that you wanna do in their life. God, I pray for those who are struggling with addictions this morning. God, those who are struggling with substance abuse, those who are struggling with with pain and depression and hurt and doubt, those who who have struggles that, that they just can't seem to shake, God, that today that they would go from being in those pains, in those struggles to being made new in Christ, God, that today that we would choose you, that we would choose you today, that we would choose you tomorrow, that no longer would this just be something to do on a checklist, no longer would this just be something to do to make it seem like we're doing all right to everyone else, but today would be a decision that, that we're gonna choose you every single day because we want more of you, because we can't have enough of you. God, I pray that you would break those chains today. God, I pray that we would go from those, uh, those in pains to being in Christ today, God. You're free to move in this place, we pray. In your name we pray, amen.